very interesting that they wonder um, what is Christ play in the sense of uh, when we start teaching uh, for a school semester or as we do in, uh, in North America, we have a few recovery for that period of time. Of course, this method uh, takes a huge amount of time to let the students go through the experience of discovering each detail by themselves, which is what is done by the summer which is you cannot leave the students in the beginning of the class and uh, can say to them and discover whatever it is here or we found out. Uh, it requires these students to read the material in advance in order to get there and then to really to be faster in discovering stuff. I will do that for your lecture to them from how. So there is a price to pay, which is this method is not so efficient. So efficient so the big question is how much do you feel so now that you cut the tool when you compare with the traditional and how have you adapted you can cover we focus in on one how much material can I cover using this method as opposed to the conventional method. Um, whether it's the conventional method or this sort of research-based type of teaching, um, the crucial question is not how much can I cover, but how much did the students learn? Okay. Um, we all take a course and we're given the syllabus and we're supposed to cover all of these topics and then we give the students the examination at the end of the year and say well <laughs> I may have talked about it but they didn't learn it okay um, so what's the point well that gets political all right um, if the chair of your department or your dean says you have to cover this material then you pretty well have to cover that material. That's okay. Um, we're fortunate in at the University of Toronto, our department is research oriented. So there's a few of us, there's four or five of us who are have given up our formal research and concentrate on undergraduate education. And as long as the students aren't complaining to the administration, they leave us alone. Okay. So, for example, in our big first year service course, um, the second half of it says electricity and magnetism. We don't do magnetism anymore because the students don't learn it. We're not capable in the time available to have the students learn some electricity, which we can do, and some magnetism. So they haven't noticed, and we're not telling them. <laughs> I'm sorry? They must learn magnetism in the end. They want a degree in physics, for instance. If they go to the number of courses that students are taking. Well, we're talking about a first year course, and they will take a third year course in electricity and magnetism. They can get some magnetism there. Okay? I mean, we would teach magnetism if the students were learning it. Well, wrong terminology. We're not teaching the magnetism because the students are not learning it. We're talking about magnetism. We're lecturing about magnetism. But if the students aren't learning it, then we're wasting their time and we're wasting my time. Up, open the course. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Excellent talk. Uh, just uh, I was wondering, I see that you travel a lot and uh, you probably face this uh, challenge of uh, the size of the curricula and how we evaluate students before they go to college mm -hmm. and how teachers can cope with all of this and at the same time teach anything to the students that they actually learn. Mm -hmm. And this is a riddle to me, I've been reading lots of things around the globe and I think that in spite of the fact that in the US and Canada you are far advanced in using inquiry or problem-based learning or modern things, 
uh, most governments in the world are not using it and not allowing teachers to use it. They oblige teachers to keep covering a huge curriculum and evaluating the capacity of children to memorize things, not to, 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 to say what they know. So what's your advice for every teacher here in the room? How do we change things? Because uh, there's no one from the Ministry of Education here. Is it? So, uh, Has anyone from the government put your... <laughs> no, 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 it's the opposite. It's the opposite. They need to listen to them. They are telling the story all over again every year. So the, my, my question is precisely of this. What's uh, happening around the globe in terms of ministries of education listening to what you have to say? Well, the, uh, uh, as part of, part of the question was that North America and Canada are ahead of the rest of the world. That turns out to be not quite correct. Um, in particular, I spent two weeks in Singapore last month, and they are way ahead of the University of Toronto. There's some amazing things happening in, in the Singapore higher education. Um, there are some really fabulous things that are going on in the United Kingdom. Um, Raven Land, um, John Mayer, some of those people based at the University of Edinburgh are doing some fabulous work involving exactly this sort of teaching. Um, so that's just a, a warm-up to trying to answer your question because you've asked a very important and a very difficult question. Um, I have found in my own experience that the resistance that I get from my colleagues, other physics professors, has been a big challenge. Um, getting my colleagues to actually say, say, here's the re results of the research, okay, I don't believe it. And getting that to happen um, was the, a, a big challenge. But once I had a certain number of physics faculty who bought into this way of teaching and were using it in their classes, and class evaluations were going up, the students were much happier. So that makes the administrators happy. We were happier because the students were learning more. And once we got to that, then convincing my chair to give me the funds to do this sort of thing, and then the dean, that was fairly simple. Now, I have to tell you that I've been at the University of Toronto for long enough that the chair and the dean know me personally well enough to know that if I say, I want some money to do this, and they say no, that I'll be back tomorrow. <laughs> I want some money to do this. No. Okay, see you tomorrow. <laughs> I want some money to do this. And finally they'll say yes, just to get rid of me. <laughs> you know? So sometimes, you don't have to be mean about it. Just be stubborn. Okay? You know, don't say, if you don't let me do this, I'm going to stab myself and bleed all over your desk. Don't, don't do that. <laughs> okay? Um, and when you're dealing with the government, that's even more difficult. Um, if you can get someone with a scientific background in the government, and we were very fortunate in the province of Ontario that we had a minister of education who was actually a physicist. So we could talk to him about data. Um, but always remember that the politicians are under a constraint. They got to get reelected. It was sort of like I saw a quote of, I think it was the Minister of Finance of Luxembourg, and he was talking about the economy. What are we supposed to do about the economy? All of these problems with the banks and Cyprus. And he said, the problem is we all know what to do, but we don't know how to get reelected after we've done it. <clears throat> so when you're dealing with the politicians, Remember that they do have to answer to the electorate sooner or later, and I guess you were talking about, I think, as best I can understand, the views of the public towards teaching in your keynote earlier. And if I understood you correctly, um, if, the, if the public doesn't think that this stuff is important, then the politicians won't listen. So you talk to the students, if you're in a grade school or a high school, talk to the parents. 
because the parents vote. Okay. We have some more questions. Good morning. Uh, did you change anything in assessment? Great question. Did we change anything in assessment? Absolutely, we did. Um, students are mark driven. They're all, it's all about marks for students. Um, we sometimes act or say believe, I guess, that students are more mark-driven now than they were when we were students. I'm not sure that's true. Okay. Um, we maybe were not mark-driven, but think, back, think about your classmates when you were in school. But whatever, students are mark-driven. Students will look at your previous tests and examinations very carefully and say, what does my teacher insist that I learn? So if you want them to learn some concept, make sure to ask about it on the test. If you don't test for it, you won't get it. So physics, for example, if all of your tests are conventional problems involving formulas and putting numbers in and banging on calculators, then that's what the students will learn to one degree or another. So, for example, the sorts of conceptually based guided discovery activities that we use with our students, each and every test and examination will have questions based on those materials. We have another question back there. Have you ever given the two students a lecture on what I'm sorry? <laughs> No. No, I don't. And yes, it is totally contradictory. Lectures don't work. <laughs> yes, it makes no sense whatsoever. Um, and one of the reasons why I was hoping to get more discussion happening during the talk is when I'm really successful. I can get you to make some comment, and she will say, no, I don't agree. And all of a sudden, you're talking to each other, and then I can just stop and listen. Okay, that's what I'm trying to achieve in a class. Um, and I do it through asking questions and having these systems where the students can respond using the clickers. You can use show of hands and things like that, but clickers are the best way to do it in terms of getting the students engaged and I do very, very little lecturing. Um, some people have, have abandoned lecturing entirely. There are now introductory physics courses where there's no lectures at all. Uh, these flipped classrooms that you read about is one example. Uh, studio physics uh, originated by Priscilla Laws and Joe Reddish. Priscilla's at Dickinson College and Joe Reddish, who I mentioned before, is at the University of Maryland Studio Physics, published by Wiley. There's no lecturing in that model either. So the amount of lecturing that's going on by people who buy into the research, it goes down dramatically. It's approaching zero in my case, and has actually hit zero in some cases. Can I ask a couple questions? One of them is physics education does not stop in the first year courses. No. So what happens in your university when students take more advanced topics like uh, quantum mechanics or conventional kind of physics or statistical physics? Do you keep the same methods? Do, do your professors follow the same kind of approach? Okay, not all of my colleagues um, buy into this. Um, some of them say, well, yeah, that's nice in principle, but I've been lecturing for a long time. I'm going to keep on doing it. Um, I have a colleague at the University of Ohio who finally got converted to believing this, th th these research results. And he'd get up in front of the students, and he, he's about my age, he'd been doing it for a long, long time, and he would revert to lecturing. And finally, he got one of his graduate students to start coming in 
And every time he'd start lecturing, the graduate student would say, Bob, you're doing it again. <laughs> and he would stop. Okay? Um, so, in my department, through stubbornness and repetitiveness, um, and being, refusing to shut up, basically, um, we now have a core of faculty that buy in. And we have reformed not only our big first year course, but also the, uh, the, our, a separate first year course for our physics majors and specialists. We have reformed our fourth year optics course. We have reformed our third year quantum mechanics course. I think I've got our third year electricity and magnetism guy convinced now. We haven't done it yet. Okay. But all of these courses, it's not just us at the University of Toronto. Um, the quantum mechanics course, for example, um, the model that we're using comes out of the University of Colorado at Boulder, um, where they reformed their quantum mechanics course three or four years ago, and their materials are freely available. Uh, the outcomes are absolutely wonderful. Let me make one more remark while we're waiting for those people to get their lunch finished so we can eat. Because um, it's, it's a common concern. Um, what about conventional problem solving? I'm talking about concepts and all of these sorts of things. And the results, not only in the first year, but in all of the courses, including this third year quantum mechanics course out of the University of Colorado Boulder, and we will be seeing the results of our own conversion in about six weeks. But anyhow, um, it's consistent through all of these different courses at all of these different levels that conventional problem solving does not go down by doing this sort of reform pedagogy. It also doesn't go up very much. It doesn't really change it very much at all. So you're not doing any harm to the conventional sort of mathematical problem solving that has previously been the core of the way we evaluate students. But we gain huge strides in conceptual understanding. Well, they should be, except that their students, as a survival strategy, learn, okay, I'm going to take these formulas, and I'm going to have this question, and I'll find a formula that I think that works, and I'll put the numbers in and bang on my calculator for a while. Um, we tend to call that method of problem solving plug and chug. You plug in the numbers and you just chug away and get the answer. Um, The problem is, is that in an evaluation context, a truly challenging problem that will cause the students to think, they don't have time. So, <clears throat> something rather really would be great for a homework problem, you can't really use for an evaluation. More questions? Sure. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Another comment, I don't know if, you, if this is working, it's not working. Uh, I'm assuming that... Okay, I'm assuming that if you go into class and you do not teach, and you're still expecting the students to talk to each other and to come to the final result, even with more complex topics, uh, that is possible only if the students already have learned that or the basis of it from some other teacher, maybe the author of the book, or even from the person who wrote the guide for the experiment. So there is always someone who teaches them. What is the role of the teacher in the classroom? Is it just a person that sits there listening to them? Or is it necessary to be there at all? Why not to leave the students just by themselves? If they are actually learning with their colleagues, which supposedly wrote, uh, read the same book, so they are learning from the author of the book. Yes, that's a great point. Um, at a very bare minimum, um, <clears throat> in order for this sort of methodology to work, <clears throat> you must have the students read the material before they get together with you and their classmates. And that can range from a nearly trivial reading quiz, you know, it takes the students 10 or 15 minutes to do just before class, um, all the way to 
the flipped classrooms where they're expected to spend an hour or two reading materials and looking at videos and simulations and things like that. Anywhere in there, but in each and every case, make sure to mark it. Create it. Because if you don't test for it, the students won't get it. So make sure to, to do that. And that's an absolutely crucial step, okay, um, in making this pedagogy work at all. And then, <coughs> I will talk about peer instruction, which is where I give this, I've got a thousand students sitting in front of me, literally. And I'll give them a question, and I have them talk it over amongst themselves, get the answer, show them the results. Sometimes if they get it, if a lot of students didn't get it, I'll have them talk about it some more amongst themselves. And I'm going around, I'm sort of circulating around. However, we give the students a small but non-zero mark for answering the question and a further small but non-zero mark for answering it correctly. If we have to give the students marks, let's make them work for us by saying to the students, we want you to do well, and we'll give you a mark for doing it. Two very good questions. Thank you very much. Okay. Is there another question in the audience? Well, thank you. Thank you again for your attention. Can you go on now? So, let's thank Professor Kate Not just for the lecture, but for the outdoor. <laughs> Thank you.